Um, I want to begin our lunch on plenary um, with an acknowledgement that we are on Treaty 1 land, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. On this land, my ancestors, white European peoples, have ravaged resources, stolen land, massacred indigenous peoples, among the many violent activities in which they engage. And we, white people in Canada, um, for many of us, continue to colonize through legislation and institutional racism. This is recognition of, of where we are and the land that we are on, and the things that my people have done. So, um, you will notice there are sticky notes in the middle of your um, tables. There are also a few pens. Hopefully many of you also have pens. Um, I encourage you to use those to write questions for our panelists today. We'll have a time for question and answers. Um, and so we will use the, the formula of having you write questions on them. And then you'll give them to me. Um, and I will make sure that I can read them before I pass them on to Steve, who is our moderator today. Um, so I'd like to introduce Steve. Uh, Steve Heinrich is a settler Christian from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1 Territory, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. He's the Director of Indigenous Settler Relations at Mennonite Church Canada, and a student of activism who loves to march with his partner Anne, and the three kids, Izzy, Aiden, and Abby. So welcome, Steve, and welcome the rest of the panel. Well, as mentioned, my name is Steve Heinrichs, and I am thrilled to be here with you today. It's an honor and a real joy to be in conversation with the four amazing humans that we have on this conversation panel. Brilliant and powerful indigenous activists that will help us explore how we might do our justice work intergenerationally and in a good way, how we can sustain struggles for decolonization, and how we might even reimagine the practice of peace, and one of our topics, jurisdiction, here in the sovereign territories of the Cree, Anishinaabe, and Dakota peoples in the homeland of the Red River Métis. I'm going to introduce our friends and then explain how the conversation will go so that you all can get involved and add your voice to this collective discussion. Grandma Shingus is an elder and a survivor of the Indian residential school system that violent colonial system that extracted children from their communities, cultures, and lands in order to get the land. At the age of 13, Grandma escaped that system and eventually reconnected with her father who helped revive her awareness of her culture. Then in 2012, the Indigenous Treaty and Sovereignty Movement, I Don't Know More, rose up all over Canada and that was a key turning point for Grandma. Since then, you'll often find our friend at rallies and round dances, leading the gathered community in acts of resistance and revolution through prayer and kindness. Sarah Fontaine Sinclair is an eighth grade student in Winnipeg School Division who enjoys playing the flute, public speaking, participating in musical theater, and playing soccer like her dad, Nidan. Sarah is also an advocate for just relations and solidarity with Earth Mother and her most vulnerable. Sarah has been a courageous activist leader. She has been involved in the Fridays for Future Climate Movement. She's walked on behalf of Dying Lake Winnipeg and she's marched in support of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Thank you, Sarah. Sadie Phoenix Lavoie is an Anishinaabe Two-Spirit from Saguenay First Nation, the co-founder of this awesome magazine, Red Rising. Sadie is currently the community coordinator of Waniskatan, an alliance of hydro-impacted communities. Now, anyone who follows Sadie on social platforms knows that they are passionate about climate justice and indigenous sovereignty and that they are willing to walk the talk with costly acts of peacemaking. A former student here at the U of W, Sadie helped lead the fossil fuel divestment campaign at this institution, as well as the initiative to have an indigenous course requirement. Nigon Sinclair is from Peguis First Nation and is professor in the Department of Native Studies at the University of Manitoba. 
a fantastic educator and story weaver, Nigon generously gives much of his time, more than anyone I know, to come alongside communities who are trying to figure out how to live into the calls and demands of reconciliation. Nigon's a regular commentator on Indigenous and settler issues, and he's the author of a number of books, including The Winter We Danced. If you haven't read it, it's a profound collection of writings on the I Don't Know More movement, which Nigon was a key mobilizer for and still is. So with that, I'd like to ask everyone to please put your hands together so we can welcome our friends with a warm and This is how we're going to do things unless spirit takes us in wildly different directions, which is possible. I've got a few questions to open things up, and as Jody mentioned, there are pens and slips of paper on your table. If you'd like to ask a question, just write it down, raise your hand, and Jody's going to run around, pick up your question, and then pass those on to me. And if your question is good and legible, that's the key thing, legible, <laughs> then uh, we're going to offer you at the end of this panel a copy of Red Rising Magazine. And I also have one copy of um, Nigan's brilliant collection of Indigenous writings from these lands here. So that's also compensation if we don't get to your question, which there's a chance. Now I'm going to say to uh, my friends up here, if the questions that I ask require redirection, please do so. You have my blessing to just go in the, in the places that you want to go. You're also welcome to ask one another questions if you'd like to follow up or even lovingly push back on each other. So without further ado, let's dive in. All right, so the first question I have for you all is, in order to get to know one another, I thought it would be cool to hear what was your first ever activist engagement and how you got involved or who got you involved in such. Sarah's going to go first. Can I go first? Yeah. Okay. Don't tell your daughter what to do. Don't tell her what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah Fontaine Sinclair. My Aboriginal name is Namishi Nubikwe, which means the light that dances on the water. Um, probably the first, um, how I got into activism, and the first activism that I probably um, first started was a water walk that I participated in 2014. And it was somebody, something that my family decided to organize because the water in Lake Winnipeg had become so polluted that it was almost unlivable for any life. My family, both my grandmothers and grandfather, mother and father and aunties, walked around the entirety of Lake Winnipeg with a bucket of water and an eagle staff. Um, and that was, I participated in that water walk when I was eight years old. Bonjour. Uh, my English name is uh, Geraldine Shinyus. Uh, I come from a bear clan, and my warrior spirit is uh, Grandmother Turtle. I have two spirit names, uh, Sky Woman and Northern Lights Woman. Um, just, I was reflecting on that question while Sharon was talking, and um, my first act of uh, resistance was in uh, residential school. <laughs> we were, uh, all, all the teenagers, the youth had to, uh, they didn't have high school at the residential school, so we had to be bused into uh, Listock, Saskatchewan. So when we arrived there, we were all, all the students got off the bus, we were all dressed the same. And, you know, I had blue shirt, and my, my classmates had blue shirts, but when we got there, all the other students had, were wearing their own clothing. So we got there, and we got assigned to the classrooms, and 
we all went our way. And during the break time, during recess, we started uh, we started hearing messages of, uh, oh, you dirty Indian, you wagon burner, you squaw, and, you know those kind of those kind of messages. So, and we were um, already used to it because we received it from the nuns and the fathers and the priests. But uh, this time, these were children that were the same age as us. Um, so. We continue with our class and the day, and then the next day, like you know, it continued again. We got called names, and again. So we decided when we were on the bus that we were gonna come up with a plan, and that's the way we were as students. We always came up with a plan. <laughs> so our plan was we were gonna fight back, and and we did. So recess time came, and we went out, and they started calling us names. And they called us names again, and again they called us names. So some of the students started fighting, <laughs> physically fighting, and then we all jumped in. <laughs> so that, that was, um, so what happened was we all got the, um, they rallied us up together, and then they put us on the bus, and they put us back, sent us back to the residential school. So that was my first uh, act of resistance. Uh, okay. Uh, so my first, uh, bonjour, David. Bonjour, everybody. Bonjour, David. I'm Margarita Kell, everybody. My name's Egon. Uh, Trying to think back, our first, my first moment of resistance, uh, it was actually witnessing, I think, resistance, which really fired, you know, lit it in me. When my, uh, when I was a kid, my dad used to uh, have me on the weekends, and uh, he would go up to do court uh, in on reserves in First Nations up north, and we already lived in Asher in those days. I was about grade five, I think. Anyways, so we go up to First Nations um, all across northern Manitoba. And uh, he was a lawyer, and uh, he was one of the only Indigenous lawyers in Manitoba. And uh, I remember walking into the, the community center on the First Nation, and my dad would be the only Indigenous face in the room, other than the accused. The bailiff would be white, the judge would be white, the RCMP were all white, there was like an army of whiteness. And then the, uh, uh, the Crown Attorney was white. Everybody was white in the room. And then I'd watch my dad, sort of fight this fight for on behalf of this accused, this usually this young indigenous man. And I'd watch him just sort of uh, uh, face off against that. And I remember watching that, and I, I, that was so influential for me because for years I watched him at the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, and then I also watched him in the ceremony, and I watched him speak to audiences all across Canada kind of in similar situations. Seas of whiteness, trying to articulate who we are. And so witnessing that was really pivotal for me, but I would say that the most influential story that ever happened was we were up in, I don't know where, maybe it was Oxford House or something, um, and my dad came out of the community center. Now my dad was a very good lawyer. He really lost almost all the time. <laughs> I think representing indigenous people is a losing fight in those days particularly, still, still is in many ways. Uh, but uh, my dad used to come out of the community center, and even though he'd lose every time, uh, he would, there'd be an army of grandmothers, like sort of a long line of 15, 16 grandmothers, with their grandsons held by the ear, and they would say, this is who's going to represent you. And uh, when I saw that, uh, I remember thinking to myself, my dad's going to lose. He loses every time. And, and I, I've always kind of wondered why that was, you know, and, I, and, and if I think back now and thinking about how inspiring my father probably was for a lot of people to see an Indigenous person in the justice system and trying that fight. And now as I'm a professor and I'm a speaker and I write a newspaper that frankly is very white and is now moving and changing a lot, but, but we are, we're all still a generation of firsts. Like I think people forget that for us as Indigenous people, we are still a generation of firsts. Uh, many of us are our first dentist, our first doctor. Some of us are still finishing our very first in our in our family to finish high school, 
And that's a really interest. That is an activist move to make a commitment to be able to do that work, to be able to, to get it to move it forward. And just like my father, sort of uh, having that, that those fights, uh, those really influenced me um, uh, throughout my whole life. And, and uh, I noticed, like my father was the very first man I ever saw wear a braid in public. Um, and that was really influential on me as well. Uh, my, uh, I also saw a whole bunch of different, like when the very first thing, the very first time I saw the Peace Village in uh, 1990 uh, in solidarity with Oka and Ganesh uh, Sataki, extremely influential. I didn't, uh, I grew up like many people very ashamed and I'd say that was the first moment where I saw my, what my dad was already <coughs> doing from a very young age on a wide scale where there was thousands of people camped out at the legislature. And that's really the most influential moments for me. My name is Sadie Fings Lavoy. My spirit name is Lil King Eagle um, from Saking First Nation, Treaty One, uh, also Signatory Treaty Three, and a member of the Turtle Clan, which represents truth. Um, so I guess the first activist thing I've done. Um, I mean, yeah, we're like we're all telling stories of our like, childhood. Where was mine? Um, I think I don't know. I've always been pretty uh, stubborn, uh, as my mom will testify to that. Um, my mom always told me she's like, I just wish you took law. <laughs> like, you'd be you'd be a good lawyer. She would say she'd be telling me. Um, but. Uh, I took Indigenous Studies and Political Science here at the U of W. Um, my first year at university was when I Don't Know More happened. Um, and it was also my first time really learning about residential schools was in university. Um, and, you know, I grew up Catholic. I grew up very um, white-coated, I guess. And, you know, I just had this, like, Anger that I didn't know how to, how to deal with. Um, I didn't know how to process the information that I was receiving and the fact that I was, you know, technically a survivor of genocide. Um, and what helped me was just to go out into the street and be with the community. Um, there, that was the place where I feel like I needed. I got the most healing, um, and I be, became like a driver. Every chance and opportunity I, I could get, I would go to different community events and just be surrounded and see some familiar faces. I saw at different events and you know start piecing things together. And a lot of the times I was by myself. I didn't, you know, I didn't really bring really anyone along with me or you know didn't really need anybody else. It was just my own personal driver uh, to to go to these things. And I remember hearing Nigon speak and a bunch of people grab a and you know I gravitated towards these people of you know positive energy you know for the fight and was using anger in a positive way and using anger as like a showcase of love. So um, yeah I just I just came out all the time and people started recognizing that I was I was everywhere. <laughs> and so that's kind of how it started and I remember I was also posting stuff on Facebook, on social media, and it was like, how is nobody else outraged by what's happening? Why is nobody else freaking out about Stephen Harper and his omnibus bills? <laughs> um, to me, it just made sense to, to act. Um, and uh, I think it was my cousin, Gabby, who uh, noticed that I was posting a lot of, like, you know, fire stuff on Facebook. Um, and so she invited me out to an I Don't Know More teaching during Idle More, it was like, I'd come in, speak to our class at the U of M Social Work, um, and just tell us what, what is Idle No More. Um, so I had about an hour of talking with these, these people at the, on Selkirk at the U of M Social Work, and um, I didn't even know, it was like my first time ever talking in front of people. Um, there was like, I remember having a list of things on my hand that I wrote out, and I was so nervous, it was all sweaty, and it, <laughs> it went off, so I couldn't even read it. 
Um, and I still do. I still do get nervous every time. Um, that never goes away. I, remember, I was like explaining that earlier. Um, and yeah, all I just remember looking at my head and realizing, you know, I already have the knowledge. I already. I don't need it. Um, and I just started speaking from the heart, and I've always spoken from the heart. Um, and yeah, that was my first thing. I mean, really, I just reaffirmed that. You know, I'm really honoring my role as a um, member of the Trove. Thank you, friends. Love the truth and the shun from the heart. As all four of you know, I think you know, I'm a Mennonite and a very hairy Mennonite. We're not all like this. Um, and you probably know that Mennonites like to sometimes pretend that we aren't a political people. We imagine that we're a separate people, not engaging the realities of the state. On the other hand, there are some Mennonites who say, of course we're political, but our politics is different than the rest of the world. We are to live the nonviolent way of politics. Now, in all my years, there's one thing I've never heard a Mennonite say, and it's this. If you are born Mennonite, you are born political. But that is something I hear said all the time by Indigenous peoples and about Indigenous peoples. If you are born Indigenous, you are born political. I'm wondering what that means to you and what kind of feelings you have about being born political and how that might shape your activism.
Well, I'm 62 years old, and and it's uh, I, I've never um, seen myself as uh, political or um, at that way. You know, I know that um, that I resist political uh, policies and political decisions and uh, all those. Uh, Legislations and like you know, it's uh, I wasn't born into that. I was born into um, was I was born in Grand Rapids, uh, Manitoba. Uh, my mom had to travel from Saskatchewan to have me in uh, Grandview, uh, near my reserve, uh, Valley River, and and then she took us back. We went back to Saskatchewan and we went back on the land. And when we were on the land, that's, uh, I didn't speak any English, so I, I didn't know what political was at that time. <laughs> so I, we, were, we were living off the land, like we were, it was uh, um, a very nurturing, loving environment. Like we had that relationship and that connection with the land. That land is, is our government. That water is our government. My Kukum, like you know, she she taught she taught me everything there the first five years of my life before I went to residential school. And that those teachings that she taught me, like you know, those first five years of my life stayed with me. And they still continue to stay with me. And Later on, meeting my father, like you know, he taught me what uh, birth was and what, like you know, being born as an indigenous was something to be proud of. Hey, to like you know, I'm so I'm so proud to be brown. <laughs> I I I love my people. I love our ceremonies. I love how we. Um, we have all these gifts, like you know, our ancestors had all those gifts to share openly at initially. Like you know, we had our own government system, and they they dismantled that by placing us in residential schools and 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 um, on the um, and reserve lands and all those and all those policies that came forward to to try and make us like them, but they can't. They couldn't. So, so that's what I have to say about that. And I wanted to talk about that. Uh, my first act of resistance. Uh, um, when I was in December of 2010, Island uh, Moore came on. And I was out at the legislative, I was just coming out uh, just to see the people and the community. I didn't know when it came at that time, I just moved here. And but, uh, we were waiting for the youth to come from the forks to the ledge. And I was standing there with some elders and we were singing songs and it was minus 52 below. <laughs> And it was so cold, but we didn't feel that cold. Like, you know, it just, I felt something different. It was just like a spirit uh, connection. But you know what happened? Like in minus 52, while we were singing those songs, there was an eagle that came, an eagle. And it was, it was, uh, and it just woke me up there, right there, dead in center. Like, you know, that eagle. It's like, Grandma, you gotta wake up. No more grief, no more carrying that trauma, no more of that, you know. Like, and then I seen our youth coming, as I seen the eagle, I seen our youth coming around the corner, and it was something very powerful. It's like the eagle was greeting the youth, and that's what inspired me, like, you know, so I just wanted to talk about that piece of that resistance. Um, yeah, I, political, right, yeah, um, 
my mom, uh, you know, my grandmother was a residential school survivor, um, along with all of her siblings. Um, my uncle was actually, I think he was like the second paid highest in Manitoba residential school survivor for all the abuses that he had gone through, and um, he still hasn't recovered it from that to this day. And, um, I grew up in the res, and you know, he was my neighbor, and um, as like, res life is, your family is your neighbor. Um, I lived next door to my great grandparents. Um, without realizing how much of a privilege that was to have my great-grandparents so accessible to me as a child, um, hearing them speak Anishinaabe, um, without realizing, you know, I just knew that I was different from the beginning of, uh, when I was young, but I didn't understand what it was because we had grown up Catholic and um, there was always this, like, hole. And, um, you know, later, later filling it with things that, um, trying to understand what my identity was, um, being part French, not being fully accepted in the reserve as, you know, you're part white, you're not fully brown. Um, and then in the town, because our town and res were side by side, and then the town, we're like, you know, you're too brown, not white, not, you're too brown, not white, not. So I had gone through like serious identity crisis as a young child and also being two-spirited. Um, I just felt like I, I didn't belong at home. <laughs> and I think that was my kind of understanding of like, you know, I'm not supposed to be here. Or I don't feel like I'm supposed to be here. Um, I did move to the city when I was like 15 after my parents had split up. Um, and I think when I realized who I really was, you know, you know, it was during I don't know more, but specifically, like I remember the time was when we were having round dances at the mall, um, and I think we were at Polo Park at this time. It was after that from Portage Place, <clears throat> or one of the other, but um, we were at Polo Park, and you know. We're in the center of the mall, and there's so many native people. And it was the first time I like been, there's so many brown people all at once, and it kind of reminded me of the rest for a little bit. Um, and seeing all the, the the drummers, and then you know people on the second floor were ground dancing, people on the main floor were ground dancing. There's so many people, and just everyone just singing and dancing together. And even that was super political for just being us. And um, it took a moment, I was like, this is what I've been missing. And um, I just remember I was looking at, to my partner and I just, all I could do is just cry. There's nothing, there's no words to explain the feeling of validation mm -hmm. and um, knowing that there's a community out there but we're constantly at attack and we have to show ourselves in the most randomest ways to prove that we're human. And I think that was kind of this like understanding of, you know, our own existence is political um, and realizing, well, what do we do with that? Um, we either hide or we don't. And we showcase who we are and, and be unapologetic for that. Um, so that was kind of really like, like the affirming moment in my life was just being around the drum and people singing and dancing. Yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, yeah, I'll use this microphone over here. I'll try to not to be teacher. Um, so the uh, uh, the question of are we born political? Uh, there is, uh, to be political is to be a Anishinaabe, so I just wanted to sort of prove this to you in a moment. Um, so the, to the work that we do, uh, like there's a hundred things I can explain about what it means to be being political or what definition would be political. But basically, the world looks like this. I'm sorry to traumatize you. <laughs> That's the world. The world seeks resources and goods and profit and exploitation. 
And the problem is that indigenous peoples are now standing in the way with the final stages of those profits and exploitation. And, and you're going to hear the term ethnic conflict all the time. Uh, ethnic conflicts are really ethnic conflicts. They're indigenous peoples standing up for lands and territories. There's no such thing as ethnic conflicts. It's indigenous peoples who are standing up to protect their families and their lives. And there is nothing about us that is environmentalists. We are not environmentalists. We are lifeists. Is what we are. Uh, we're not protesters. We're protectors. You know. Um, and uh, you're going to hear the story about Sarah's name. I hope that she's willing to share it. Uh, but we we don't we we don't march because we're uh, interested in anti the uh, Trudeau slash Harper agenda because it's the same agenda. Uh, we're not anti those agendas. What we are is we really would like water for all of us to drink, and most importantly, your children to drink. We're actually working for your children and your life uh, as much as we are for our own children. Uh, uh, the side benefit to that is we all get to live. That's the side benefit to that. And, and our creation story, I'm not going to bore you too much with this, but our creation story it, our, itself gives us that task. So as Anishinaabe in our uh, Gichi Aduzukan, which is our great creation story, when we are set down, uh, and it's in every single song, it's in every single tradition, every single ceremony, you go to any single, like uh, Sidi's talking about sitting around the drum, that's the, the epitome of sitting around the drum is you learn this teaching, is that when we were set down, we were given the relationship with the earth itself, meaning that the animals, the birds, and the fish inherited us, and then we offered the gift back to those beings which we would carry the clans. And the reason why we have clans or dodems, like uh, Mikinok dodem over here, right? And I think Makwa dodem, Makwa dodem. Uh, so then, and then we get Sarah and I, Ronam and Lushin dodem, Gigo dodem, fish, fish clan. Uh, our relationships are innately with the earth, like we are connected with the earth itself. And we were given territories to live, uh, skins to eat, uh, furs to wear, and medicines to help heal our bodies. And the animals taught us all of those things in the earth itself. So that's why we signed with uh, dodemic markings on the clan, on the treaties, our clan markings on the treaties. And like when you see this, this has nothing to do with environmentalism. Like none of it. Uh, it has everything to do with us living fundamentally who we are. Like we, we are living up to the names itself in which we have been offered. So probably the most important thing to understand is that to describe us as political is to just to define Anishinaabe, because uh, we don't we're not we're not protesting anything. We are protecting ourselves and most importantly all the life that we share relationships with, A.K.A. you. But you are just like half a percent of that. Uh, we're we're interested in the bears as well. We're interested in the water. We're interested in the air. We're interested in the trees. All of those things because we share unique relationships with it. And that was as teacherly as I'm going to get, so I apologize. <laughs> Be teacherly, friends. This is good. Okay, so your dad mentioned that you had a uh, story to share around your name. Did you want to share that now? Or? Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> and it means light that dances on the water, as I said. And, um, an elder named Dale Nsiabit gave me that name, and it refers to the waters in Thunder Bay. He gave me that name so I could always have a place to understand myself. Um, a few, like I think a year ago, my dad took me to that certain place where he dreamt about for my dream for my name. And when I saw that place, I thought of how special that was to actually have a place that I could go to to see my identity and to see my me on the water. Yeah, that's just returning back to the question about manics, thinking about our connections to these lands, like we we don't fundamentally think in those kind of relationships and seeing ourselves in the land. Okay, 
Okay, since you've responded to so many questions off the hop, you get to pick who gets to answer. Have an easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> so as older and younger Indigenous leaders, you often link arms with, with settler peoples in these struggles for justice. Now such alliances can be beautiful, but they can also be hard and fraught with much tension. What are some of the key challenges of working with settlers? And what are some of the big things that settler allies like me need to learn or unlearn so that we can walk better together? Sarah gets the pick. Yeah, Sarah, Sarah gets the pick. Okay, okay. mine's quick. So again, I'll just tell a story. Actually, no, I'll, I'll story. So uh, it's very hard for me to not work with PowerPoint. Can you tell? How many professors do we have here? Let's all go to therapy together. So it's very hard for me to sort of go. I got some good images I should. Anyways, yeah. Uh, okay, well, I'll just tell you one story. So I come, I'm the most Manitoban of Manitobans, and I don't say that to compete with anybody, but to say that, um, so I'm Anishinaabe and Cree from my dad's side, so my dad comes from not only Manicotogan, uh, but also Norway House, and then of course we settled in St. Peter's Indian Settlement, which is a uh, former site, Pegasus First Nation, uh, still is Pegasus First Nation, north of Selkirk, uh, forcibly removed in 1907. Uh, and then my mom, comes from the Gamash family of the Paw, and then the Warren family from Regina. And that I, basically what I'll say is that my mother's family, uh, French and English, um, and most of them live in Calgary, which should tell you about their political affiliations. <laughs> my uh, family are like the original, my mom's side, the original reform partiers. Like they're like <laughs> Preston Manning kind of reform party. Anyways, so, uh, so I don't know if you saw a picture of the show a little bit while ago, but it was uh, Sarah and I marching in the, um, Remember the Lumbee totem pole for Standing Rock? Remember that at the forks? Yeah, we were all there. We were all there. And uh, anyway, so there's a picture there. And my auntie from Calgary said to me, she said, why don't you people stop protesting and complaining all the time? And I said, auntie, I'm your people. There's no you people here. And it was oddly enough Thanksgiving. And I, went, I, said, I said, look around the room. We're all related. There's no you people here. It's only our people. And that is the best, best uh, answer I can give to you. The biggest struggle when I deal with Canadians and that I deal with non-Indigenous peoples is the idea of there's no you people here. There's only our people. And that means that Indigenous success means your success. It means that when we have the urban reserve built, for example, at 1075 Portage, which is just over, up the road here, um, you know what happened within three months? Every single person's property value increased because it's guaranteed commercial development. And even if Pegasus were to go into bankruptcy, the bills would still be paid. <laughs> and so that means that everyone's housing uh, grows, uh, the values grow, and that means that, what did, what did that tell you? Every single person should want an urban reserve on your corner. <laughs> That's what that tells you. It, and and uh, because indigenous peoples bring commercial development and they bring most importantly social and cultural development into your area, they make you a better community. And so, uh, and then I can add a hundred other things. I can say, you know, it, I, when Indigenous peoples are a part of uh, people's lives, not only does that make you a better person, it makes you a better Canadian because then you understand your driver's license and you understand the word Manitowabo and you understand the word Kanata, you understand the word Winnipeg. You would never dump sewage in the Red River system if you understand the word Winnipeg that's talking about the algae. Well, surprise, surprise, we have over algae production, which is why Sarah was marching. Um, it, when you become that kind of fluent, understanding, culturally literate Canadian, then things begin to happen. You start to go, wow, there's a problem here. We have 99.8% of the land, most of it's stolen from Indigenous people. That's not really what Canada was supposed to be about. It means the village, that's what the word means. And then we say, well, that's a, we actually live in a devastating, hierarchical, brutal, draconian, genocidal country. Because that's when you realize, and then that's when you become fluent. And that's the, that's the challenge, is are we ready to become our people, or do you still want to call each other you people? Mm -hmm. I just ask a clarification question with you on. So most of the folks that are gathered here, there, there might be some reform, old reform party affiliates here, but likely not. Like this is, like, well, a lot of us are the, the people who are trying to work at it, trying to do like, um, you know, 
we're reading decolonization theory, we're trying to be involved in grassroots movements and all that. So what would you say though is like on the cutting edge for the settler activists, the ones like like myself who pride ourselves like humbly, we're trying to to trying to do this. We're not the ones who are saying, why don't you get over it and move on? But we're and those are the places I find are often like the most difficult is sitting in those circles and saying, like, we did it. Oh, we're screwing up again. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely no easy task. I mean, I'm sure people, settler people, get frustrated just as much, like, when trying to find common ground. Um, and there's a lot of times of butting heads. And, um, <coughs> like I said earlier, I'm stubborn. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm stubborn for, like, many reasons. Um, one, because I... I, I'm, I'm, val I'm honoring my ancestors, um, and they know, like, they give me that um, purpose. Um, and then I know that, like, I speak, they speak through me. Um, and I am a firm believer on matriarchy. Um, I believe that woman leadership and two spirit council is kind of the way to go, and it seems to work and it has worked for generations and millennia within our own communities and um, so why not now is kind of how I feel. And so I've had times of, you know, holding other men accountable, indigenous men, non-indigenous men. Um, and I try to do it in a humbly way and I try to explain and, you know, not get mad and angry. Um, but there's always a justification as to why things are, should be a certain way. Um, and sometimes it, it, the battle is always with confusion um, and having to explain. And sometimes it's like exhausting having to explain the same thing in five different ways. Um, but one, one example that I see is like pretty, um, pretty great is, you know, with Red Rising, for instance, like we're a mixed group of non-Indigenous and Indigenous people working together, but it's still Indigenous-led. And, um, like, I know we don't always get it right. Um, we've had to do, go through growing pains and, and figure out, understand, what does that mean? Um, and we try to be an example of, like, uh, we, yeah, we try to be an example of, you know, what does that look like? Um, what does, you know, engaging with Indigenous and non-Indigenous, but yet Indigenous leadership? And a lot of it is based on trust. Um, trusting good intentions, um, but also understanding choice and consequence. Sometimes you can have good intentions, but the consequences may not be as beneficial as you think it is going to be. And so sometimes being told that is, is hard to accept. Um, so trusting each other in that, yes, we're all well-intentioned. Um, but we need to be mindful um, um, that sometimes consequence is, is harmful and has indirect consequences. And so highlighting that and being frank and blunt, you know, can be very off-putting for some people, but um, I usually just say how it is because there's no way of moving forward without acknowledging if we're, if we're dealing with an issue. So if there's something that comes up along the way, I'm like, hey, stop. Let's deal with it, because if we're just going to continue to move forward with, um, we're, we're not actually holding each other and helping each other through that. And um, non-Indigenous people need Indigenous peoples, but Indigenous peoples also need non-Indigenous peoples. It's acknowledging the fact that we work better together than separately and in silos. And um, a lot can be done. You know, Red Rising is a testament of that. And I'm a firm believer in collaboration, but at the same time, I need people to also trust Indigenous leadership and to accept being told what to do, because matriarchy has worked in the past, and what's stopping it from continuing forward? Um, and it's a level of trust, trusting in matriarchy, trusting in Indigenous leadership, and accepting, you know, some things to be told to you. Um, and I think. 
sometimes there has to be sacrifices to be made, and you know, indigenous peoples face many sacrifices. We're not, we're accepting of that. Um, but it's a level of like, can I trust you to, to give up some things in order for the betterment of all of us? Wendy, could I get some water? Yes. Well, that's a huge question. Like, it's like I could cover so many areas. Um, myself, um, as an educator and also as a, as a grandmother and a residential school survivor, I, um, I, well, as a residential school survivor, I go out and I educate the truth, okay? Because um, um, a lot of our uh, the regular school systems back then didn't teach that truth. Like, you know, when I went to school, I didn't know. I didn't find out until I went to university about residential school. And then my classmates, I found out, went to residential school, I didn't know. So I, what I do, I guess when the TRC came to a close in June of 2015 is that I, um, I needed to go out there and share that truth, to continue with that truth because uh, people needed to know because like you know those documents, those books are going to be sitting on a shelf and nobody's going to pick them up. And, and there's only a few of us survivors left, and we need to, uh, there's a lot of them out there sharing their stories. So I go to <coughs> schools, and I, you, like, um, elementary and junior high and high school, university, and even um, Mennonite College, and we, um, I share my story, my nine years experience. But I do it in a way not to, I'm not out of anger or blame, but only my own whole purpose is to share that truth. Because, um, and I probably shared with probably over 10,000 people already, so they know my story, they're witness to it. But also, I've asked them to uh, do more research on residential school, but also to share my story. So, and that's what they're doing. So, in, we, I, prior to that, I was getting tired of uh, explaining. Like, you know, even like now, I still get tired of explaining to um, the Canadian society. And, but in all of that, in that sharing, I, I get allies. Eh? <laughs> and they come out and they, they come and they, they hear, once they hear that truth, then you've, you've, you've sparked something. And for each one of you, you know, when you're learning, you too have to find out who you are, where you come from. And when you find that out, then what was your contribution, what was your ancestors' contribution to to our history. And you're gonna find yourself um, healing from that. Like when I teach in the University of um, Manitoba with the, with the doctors, like I sit there as an elder, I, I help them, I guide them to find out who they are. And in that transformation, when I see them from, when they start that course to the end, there's a whole transformation that witness, what I witness, is something phenomenal. And, and it's, it's, it's such a, so beautiful to see, like, you know, for them to connect with that spirit and with that truth of spirit. So I just wanted to share that and say, thank you. by climate change. Um, 
we are the one acting ones acting like adults when so many adults are acting like children. <laughs> we are demanding that our prime minister to do something. And I think that in the same way that we can learn things from indigenous peoples, um, that we, indigenous peoples can teach you things to have, and when you have conversations with them, you can learn things from kids too about climate change. And I think um, we all need to think about our um, plastic that we use and our garbage that we throw away and recycle more, compost more, um, and learn things from other people. I was in a big climate change uh, conversation with a, a group of 40 plus folks yesterday and it was really interesting to hear the, the defensiveness in the room to in response to the youth movement. So at the same time that there was a lot of adulation and praise for the young and their leadership, there was, there was quite a bit of resistance in saying, you know, but they don't realize, you know, all that we've done and so on and so on. And it kind of taps into, I think, um, the same kind of postures and logics that are at work amongst white settlers like myself, this defensiveness to say, we're not in this space, like we need to step back and receive leadership you know, and live into that. Um, my last question, and then we'll jump into some audience questions if we have time, and that is, what sustains you? All four of you are, give uh, incredible time and effort to these struggles and these pursuits for right relationships, and all four of you carry so much. So how do you do it? What sustains you, keeps you keeping on and not dropping out? Sarah, and you, again, you can pick whoever you want. <laughs> um, whoever's ready. <laughs> I can Okay, hello. Okay, what sustains me, how oh, keeps me going? Uh, it's, it's quite uh, easy and it's one word and, and it's love. It's love for, um, for the land, for the water, for the people, all people, not, not just our indigenous people. And, 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 and that spirit of love, like you know you can you can carry on. <laughs> you can walk through waters and walls and walk through um, lateral violence, walk through, like, you know, anything, because uh, it carries you and it um, guides you. And, but in, in all of that, sometimes I have to take a step back and I have to take care of myself because uh, I'm getting old, eh? <laughs> I, uh, I need to, I need my rest, I need my naps, and I, I need my vitamin C, and my weakness, and <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, and all of that, like, what I like, what keeps me going is, like I talked about it earlier, is that transformation, and, uh, and how, We've come such a long way from when I was a little girl, eight years old, six years old, in a, in a little girl's dormitory, crying myself to sleep because I was lonely. I wanted to be with my parents. We've, I, we've come a long way. And our youth, like, She's so inspiring, like, you know, I'm just, I'm just so proud as I hear her speak, like, you know, and even Sadie and Nigan, like, you know, they, they inspire me so much, and I know that we're going to get there, eh? <laughs> and, and I know my, our great-grandchildren are going to get there, and I know that uh, our ancestors are going to be at rest when that happens. I go say <laughs> I get asked this every once in a while, um, or like, how do, you, how, do you, how do you 
you do that? <laughs> How do you keep going? And, you know, I don't even really have an answer, to be honest. Like, I don't, to me, um, not doing anything is worse. So, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of dealing with the same things. Um, and I hear it in like over and over again, not even just from me, but like my friends. And it does get tiring. Um, and I mean, my friends like making fun and laughing at each other and um, using laughter as a way of coping um, and laughing through our traumas and laughing through, you know, really. You know, something that you feel you uncomfortable to laugh at, but really it's like our only way um, because we've been so exhausted. Um, what, what do you have to do left but to laugh? And I think that's kind of um, what I know, like youth who are like you now grand elder youth like me, <laughs> um, who are getting older, you know, I've been doing it, I, I don't know how, I don't know how grandma does it, like, I don't know. Um, there's so many people who've been doing it for decades, and I've been doing it for like, what, seven years? And like, I'm just blown away, and I wanna know, like, I wanna know, like, how do you, how do you keep doing it? Um, but, you know, one of the things I know for sure is like, I get these like, urges to like, get out of the city and um, go be, go for a walk in like the forest or in the bush. Cause that's just like where that peace and calmness, um, you know, fills me up and say like, this is why I'm doing it, you know? Um, Cause for me, it's like, why do I, I don't know why, why do I like purposely tire myself out? <laughs> you know, I don't even understand it, but really I know that when I go back home, um, or I, like when the bush used to be my back, backyard, like the bush was my playground. So I guess when I go back there, it gives me a sense of like this um, sense of innocence. Because really I am innocent to what I'm dealing with. And it's really solidifying that and saying, you know, yes, you don't deserve this, but you're doing everything you can. So, and like it's just, being able to like meditate with nature and um, feel calm. Because I deal with deep PTSD, depression, anxiety, all that stuff when I'm in the city. And um, even the noise, like, that was one thing like growing up in the res and then moving to the city was like a big culture shock for me was um, city life. I just I can't be accustomed to it. And, um, so, yeah, every chance I get, I'll go out, go to a sweat, go to a ceremony. Um, even if it's just on the outskirts of the city, I'll try my best. Um, and bring my friends with me. That's, that's the only thing. And obviously, centering my, surrounding myself with people who I don't have to explain. You know, like they just get it. They know, because they're going through it too. Um, and so there's just like this level of understanding with each other and we lift each other up when we're down and we know that it's, it, we're in it for the long haul. So, and we're the sacrifice generation. So we know like there's no way of getting out of it. there's still pipelines being built, emissions being released, glaciers melting. But I always ask myself in those moments, if not you, who? And if not now, when? I do this work because I'm doing it for my future. I'm honoring my ancestors who have fought for my future. They signed treaties to protect and share the land my ancestors wanted my generation to have clean water, lakes, and oceans. 
to look freely without worrying about if my government is going to put climate first, to put this generation first. I'm doing it to protect me, because water is me. It's my identity. Water is also all of you. All of our bodies are made of water. So I'm walking to for all of us. My Ojibwe name, Nimishi Nubikwe, means a light dances on the water. Light can't dance on water if oil is clouding it. I have to protect the water because it's my job. It's been my job ever since I was named Nimishi Nimishi and Nibens, and now Nimishi Nibekwe. I'm doing this so there is a next seven generations. I should be honest, I'll say one other thing. The most amazing thing for me is that every time I didn't feel like doing it, I'd get a text from Leah Gazan or from Sadie or from Grandma saying, why aren't you here right now? And uh, so I, I get tired too. Uh, but then I think to myself, like, part of being part of a family, and I remember I didn't know uh, either one of these wonderful, incredible people. Uh, before I don't know more and uh, when we took one on that journey together we're still on that journey together and we don't see each other except for these kind of functions but uh, I'm so dependent on the uh, the work of my relatives in this movement and I include people like Steve and Wendy in that movement and the people that I've met I never would have I never would have met those incredible people who inspire me unless I had gone the bravery to take the step which I was not comfortable to do incredible anxiety, I suffer from anxiety, and having anxiety to be able to go out and do this kind of thing, and talk about it, and go and speak at the legislature, and, and uh, like, I, I get very nervous doing that, I get very sweaty, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm a very sweaty person, and it's, uh, uh, I would never have met these incredible people who inspire me and demand me to be better. And uh, I'm not just talking about the happy conversations, I'm talking about the tough conversations sometimes of being called out, you know, and I need those as well. So yeah, that's, well, that's what I, that's what keeps me going, is being, trying to be a better person. If I'm reading this uh, note right, uh, it said I'm, I only have five minutes left for the conversation that was about ten minutes ago. So um, <laughs> what I'm going to do though is I'm going to name two of the questions that the audience lifted up. And if any of you would like to stick around to engage a few folks in these conversations, feel free. Otherwise, I'll bear it back and I'll, I'll talk to some of them. Um, the two questions are, across the borders, beyond local regional actions, what does 21st century solidarity allyship need to look like? And the second question was, how do you deal with the nightmares, the unresolved traumas, and old feelings of worthlessness? So on behalf of this gathered community, I want to thank you, Grandma, Sidi, Nigon, and Sarah for uh, just the, the care that you engaged this conversation with um, for your amazing leadership that you gift our wider Winnipeg and Manitoba community with. So you guys really are amazing leaders and we're so grateful that we're creating and sustaining <coughs> on the line.